good days, I've had bad days, tasted victory and defeat. I've had problems, big as planets, turned to pebbles when you speak. I've had nothing to my name, never lacked for anything. Good morning. Welcome to service this morning. We're glad you're here. My name is Dusty. I'm the pastor at Parkway Church, and we're delighted to have you for service this morning. And uh, if this is your very first time here, right after service, I'd love for you to grab. We have a, a newcomer bag for you and a little gift for you to send home with you today. And I'd love to say hi to you there, and thank you for coming to church. And I want to give you just a couple announcements at the start of our service, and uh, lots of stuff going on in the life of our church. And uh, the first thing I need to do is apologize for the bad job I've done at doing announcements for the past couple weeks. We, uh, we've uh, had a great night last night. Uh, Esther the Musical was performed at Evangel Temple. There's three of our teenagers uh, that are part of that, and great time. Hundreds of people there, really good time to be together, and I gave you the wrong date about three weeks in a row. So you have missed it. If you're planning on going to it tonight, it's already happened. Uh, so if you're part of our directory, you will get a little email uh, this week uh, and just give you the dates where you can see it locally or a little, little closer around Belleville, some of those places uh, they'll be performing as well. So sorry for that and uh, great time together and hopefully you can connect at one of the dates uh, coming up. We have some great, great things happening this week. Uh, February 26th, Monday evening right here. Uh, we have our next prayer and worship rally, and we do these usually once a month, and a special guest speaker, and just an extended time of worship and prayer together. And uh, unlike, a, I would say, a, a, a traditional prayer meeting at a church, uh, you're gonna, as you arrive, you're not going to be sort of sequestered into a whitewashed room and uh, forced, forced to pray in front of people out loud that you don't know. You really can show up and uh, just be part of worship time together. It'll be lovely. And uh, if you choose to, just offer up some prayer requests that people can pray for uh, at the end of the service. Great time of worship and great guest speaker, Barry Somerville, has been a supporter of Parkway since it began and uh, has a great testimony and has been involved in a ministry called LL. Anybody familiar with LL Ministries uh, in Westport? He's served, served there over the past few years and will be sharing a little bit about that. But great guy will be sharing this Monday evening uh, at 7. Small groups are starting up this week, a whole bunch of them. And uh, if you go into the lobby there afterwards, you'll see some clipboards where you can sign up for a small group. Some of them say full on them, so don't try to sneak in. They'll know. Uh, some of them are full, but there are still some spaces in some of them. If you'd like to be part of a small group, uh, yeah, join in, sign up, and they'll be starting this week. If you're new to our church, if this is your first time here, you've been here for a few months, uh, we love if everyone sort of connecting or looking for information about our church would be part of something that we call Unite 101. So it's a course for just new people to our church. It's two weeks long. I say course, a small group. Uh, two weeks long uh, happening at our church right here. And it starts this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So there's a sign-up sheet for that. Uh, you can sign up and let us know you're going to be part of it. And great place to just ask about our church, ask questions, ask me a question about it, uh, about connecting further, uh, further to our church. We have a, a, a course that we are offering as a church through our Bible college in Sussex, New Brunswick. It's a university-style Bible college course that you can take online, and it's done in a hybrid sort of way where you do, the, do readings connected to that course, just like you would at university, and submit papers, things connected to that, and you do your classroom experience right here at church. So it's sort of like going to Bible college without having to leave town. And a really great opportunity and uh, a great form of growth. If you've never done that type of small group or learning before, there's a cost to it. We have scholarships for it through our church to sponsor you to take it if that's an, an issue and would be helpful to you. Uh, we want people to take these. Uh, they are useful if you're working towards an ordination process of becoming a reverend. We, we can do that on site uh, over months and years and help you towards that. But you can really just take them for your own spiritual growth. They're a great opportunity. Everybody who's taken them at our church, it's been a wonderful experience. And I want to open that up to you. They start this next coming week. So if you have questions about that, let me know. I can talk to you after service. Uh, we'd love to get you connected to that process. Really good stuff. Next Sunday, we have a Protect All meeting for those of you who are involved in kids' ministry, youth ministry, right here at the church, working with minors. We do this through our insurance and just securing a safe environment for everybody at church. So if you're working in those ministries right after church, we have lunch for you. I'm going to do a little training uh, after service. Next week is a social Sunday. And if you're new to our church, usually once every month or two, we have a social Sunday. So as you arrive for service on Sunday morning, 
First service is going to end a little early, and second service is going to start a little late, and it'll give you a chance to meet up with people from the other service, have some snacks, some coffee, some cookies, all those kinds of things in between happening right here. We have a great conference that our church is hosting uh, in the next few weeks here, March 23rd to 25th, right here, uh, Saturday, uh, starting at 8 a.m. with breakfast. It's entirely free. And then a special guest speaker, Steve Elliott, Dr. Steve Elliott. He is our national superintendent. He's a published author. Uh, We'll be sharing that morning on signs and wonders in evangelism. He'll be sharing on Sunday morning uh, on hearing and heeding the voice of God. And Pastor Al Vardy, who's part of our congregation, will be sharing on healing from emotional wounds in our life. It's entirely free. We would love you to sign up for it uh, just so we have enough breakfast for you on Saturday morning. You can do that uh, where all the sign-up sheets are for small groups as well uh, to be part of those things. We don't pass offering plates at our church. It's, our ministry is dependent on the faithful giving of people in our church community, around the community. And if you'd love to give to our church, there's an offering box at the back and you can give online as well. We appreciate that uh, as you've served God that way and honored Him. Glad to have you here today, excited for what the Lord has for us in service. Why don't you stand and welcome somebody to church, say hi, shake a hand, and the band's going to come lead us in worship this morning. Hosanna, 
You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. This is a new song for this church. It's called I Thank God. It talks about how Jesus changes us and from a sinful state to a, a holy and a saved state. It's about being thankful for the changes that he's made in our lives.
before we start this song, the kids can be dismissed to their kids' program. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, and oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. before me let me be singing when the evening comes you're rich in love and you're slow to anger you're rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I
be seated. Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing. Let's thank the band for leading us today. Yeah, thank you guys. We are going to send our kids out in just a second, but we're going to pray for them first, all right? Let's pray for our kids before they head to the program. Jesus, we thank you for all the kids at church today. Would you reveal yourself to them? Would your Holy Spirit meet with them as the word is spoken? God, be with the leaders as they lead and teach. And bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, you can head your program. You guys can head out. Did they already go? <laughs> Some of you look a lot younger than you are. <laughs> I feel like I got mis- misinformation there somewhere in the lobby or somewhere in between here. Well, they've been prayed for and sent twice. If one of you wishes you were a child this morning, you're free to go right now. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Good, good. Let's dig into the scripture. Real excited today to look at Mark chapter 5. And if you have your word there, we're going we're gonna to turn to it together. we get it on the screen as well. And we're going to take a, take a look. If you're new to our church the past little while, we've been working through Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, leading into Easter. Uh, so as you, you join us on Easter weekend, Good Friday, we'll have information about those services as they get closer, preparing some special stuff for that weekend uh, as well. Uh, but uh, we've been working through the book together. So if it's your first time here today, grab a little uh, a handout at the back over by our welcome table there, and you can track along with us as we study through the gospel together. We're sort of doing it chronologically. We're going to land on Jesus' final days, right, on Good Friday, and kind of follow the story along that way. So we've been working through the book uh, together. So Mark chapter, chapter 7, let's take a look there this morning. It's been really fun to, uh, when you study through a book like this, sometimes it, it allows you to sort of hit some passages maybe that you've never preached on before. And the title of our message today uh, is A Covenantal God. So I'm going to read our scripture this morning, and you can follow along. We're reading out of the New International Version. This is what it says. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come up from Jerusalem and gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing. And the little brackets in your Bible in the text there today, it seems as if historically that Mark was written towards people who were not Jewish in particular. There's explanations given about things that the Jews would have just understood in the first century. It's a little explanation given. We'll give some more explanation to that in a second. They give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, keyword traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Jesus replied, Isaiah was right. And boy, Jesus just says it. (laughs) Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his mother or father is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might, be, might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is, devoted to God. Then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify, and this is the key thing, if, if Jesus' example is a little confusing, he sums it up really, really well uh, for us who are a little foreign to maybe some of the conversation on old covenant law and tradition. You nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. And after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into the heart, but into their stomach and out of the body. He went on, from within a person is what defiles them. 
For it is what is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, all kinds of awful stuff. Slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. There's three things I want to grab before we get into our message. I have a little habit of saying this is going to be a longer introduction to a really short message. But I want us to catch three sort of principles that are at play in the, in the scripture we're looking at today. Three sort of things that come together in Jesus' sort of conflict with the religious leaders. The first one is this. The old covenant law that the Jews were under. The Jewish people were under covenant. God is a covenant-making God that made covenants to his people all through history. The word for covenant in Hebrew is bereth. It, it means, in a sense, the root of the word, it means a cutting. In an ancient Near East, in the Old Testament times, people would cut a covenant with each other. And the word cut, why it's used, they literally would cut animals in half, right? And the two parties that were making the deal or making the negotiation with each other would walk through, walk between the, the severed animals, blood splattered in between. This sounds like a grisly affair uh, to people who live in the 21st century and live in Canada to make a deal this way. But the image that was left behind was very serious. I think I remember as a child accidentally coming across some mafia movie on TV as a, as a kid and seeing these mafia guys make a blood covenant with each other, right? There was a seriousness to the, the shedding of blood. And the two parties would walk between the pieces. And in a way, they were sort of saying, if you don't live up to your part of the covenant, <laughs> slice, you're done. It was serious, serious language used. In marriage, we sometimes say covenant still. It's, it's sort of become a word that's not used a lot in our culture. An irrevocable promise. God made covenant with his people. In the Old Testament, there was multiple covenants. There was a covenant made to Noah, one made to Abraham, one made to Moses, and one made through David that were promises to God's people. Promises with qualifications of how they were supposed to behave within the covenant, within the negotiation, within the deal with his people. One in particular that we're going to look at today was this Mosaic covenant. But if you look back in the history of God working with his people, when God made a covenant to Abraham, there, there were, the animals were cut. And, and if you read the story, it's sort of humorous in some way. Abraham is waiting around he knows this covenant is being made with God, waiting around for God to appear, show up. How is this going to work? And it says that Abraham falls asleep and God, in a way, went between the pieces of the covenant and let Abraham sleep through the whole thing. It was a way of kind of saying, I am going to keep my part of the deal up and I don't expect much from you. And God being faithful to deliver on his covenant, even in the frailty and insecurity and sort of humanness of Abraham, he lives up to his side of the covenant. The Israelites were eventually under this Mosaic law given through Moses. In the Mosaic law, there were 60, 613 laws. There were moral laws on how they should behave, ceremonial laws on how they should act in the culture that they were in, how sacrifices should be given at the temple. And in every covenant, there was a spilling of blood. Now, I remember, I remember as far as this Mosaic covenant, it came up in a newcomer's class. We were studying the scripture for the first time, and there was a new believer in the class, and we were reading these passages out of the Old Testament where the blood of animals was spilt, right, before, before the temple, and they just sort of raised their hand. It was the most honest thing. They just said, I, I just got to say something. I think this is crazy. They were really... Like, like killing all these animals? Why, like, why? Why does God require this? Why is this? It was so foreign to them. This is somebody that loved animals. They were imagining, and they were disturbed by these innocent animals bleeding out before God, and God asking for it. Really interesting study of the world and all the cultures that have emerged over the planet through the ages shows that this history, even from Genesis, there seems to be like little pieces of it that spread all over the planet. All these ancient cultures that practice some sort of blood sacrifice that remained afterwards. It happened right in the beginning at Genesis, the first time people sinned. Adam and Eve sin, they're filled with shame before God, they run from God. You know the story, if you went to Sunday school, they sew fig leaves together to cover up their nakedness. There's a shame, right? 
that happens. How many people remember the flannel graph? That was always a weird character in the flannel graph, Adam and Eve, with the fig leaves sewed together. But what's strange about the story is, is they try to cover their shame on their, all, on their own. And God, it's, it seems like a little side note in the story, their covering was not good enough. Because in their sin, something had to die. God promised this. If you sin, it will bring death. And right off the bat in Adam and Eve, God chooses something else other than Adam and Eve to die, right? It says animals were were, were killed, right? And, And clothing was made out of the animals for Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, the very first book of the Bible, right? God is finding a replacement for the guilty sinner and using an innocent animal in the place the whole way through. And the Jews had centuries upon centuries of animals being slaughtered, a constant reminder that their sin brings death and something had to die. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. It's the blood that makes atonement by the life. Something had to die in the place of our sin. Now, it's strange, all these cultures around the planet doesn't mean they did it under God's direction or were doing it the way that God prescribed. The sense that something was wrong with them and something had to be done before God to make things right spread all over the planet. Socrates, a Greek a philosopher, even talked about under Greek religion and all these things, said, said this, it, it might be possible that God or the gods can forgive sin, but I can't see that there'd be any way. And what he was referring to was the stark difference from whatever he thought might be God and the absolute frailty and sinfulness of mankind that he witnessed everywhere. How could anybody ever forgive who we are and what we are? So for centuries, the Jews lived under this Mosaic covenant, 613 laws. They were under it. They were trying to obey it. They were failing at it. And all this time, this law was never intended, the law itself, the obedience to it, the law's intention was never to make them holy before God. Its intention was to reveal their sinfulness. Hebrews 10 says this, the law, the Mosaic law, is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise... Would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed, and I love this word because it comes up again near the end of our message today. If it had worked, they would have been cleansed once and for all and would have stopped sacrificing the animals and would have no longer felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Romans 3.20 and 4.15 talk about the law, its intention and its purpose was to bring knowledge of our sinful nature and our sinful behavior. The speaking of the law out, we were never going to live up to it, but it would reveal the necessity of a Savior, the necessity of a perfect sacrifice that we could not do on our own. It revealed the holy character of God and our distance from it. I would tell you a story. A couple years ago, we were at a pastor's conference, and uh, yearly we have a, a conference that we do as our denomination, and we talk about issues related to church and vote on things and all these things. And somebody was sharing at the concert and at, at the conference, and he was sharing on the gifts and responsibilities of, of a pastor and all these things. Now, I may have the number wrong, but as he was sharing the role of what a pastor is, he got up and he said, scholars have identified some 140 skills that a pastor is expected to have. And I could see around the room the scowls, laughter, and like... Because all of us collectively, he, he did it on purpose, by the way, all of us collectively just went like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to live up to that. And as they listed them off, you could sense, it's really funny, they, they, they were getting us to call out some of the skills that we thought were required. I, I called one out, if you want the story, I'll tell you another time, I said, hostage negotiator. That's a good, that's a good skill to have as a pastor. We were all saying things out, right, that, that we thought pastors should have. What it did, it did something really interesting as the list went off. Collectively, all of us went, I can't be all these things. And the other thing that did that was even a little bit more 
interesting. I'm being really honest here. I don't, I don't like doing some of those things. And the giving of the law, the Mosaic law, had the same effect on the hearers in a way. They heard it and went, I can't live up to that. And it also made them go, I don't even in my heart want to live up to that. It revealed this rebellion even against the morality and holiness and perfection of God. In the same way, the law exposed our inability to do it and even exposed our disdain and dislike of the holiness of God even. I don't even want to be that way. I want something else. You could see this fall over us. Now, for the pastors that was there, it was supposed to encourage us to go, as the body of Christ, there's all sorts of things you're not good at that other people can help with, right? That was the heart of it. But it was supposed to expose how nobody could do this on their own. And the law did the same thing. It was spoken to us to go, I can't do this. I can't live up to the holiness of God on my own. I can't attain it. Romans 3.20 says this, No one is declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, there were good Jews in the first century, and I, I mean this literally, Simeon and Anna, if you read Luke chapter 2, the story of Christ's birth and his childhood, they were waiting around the temple. And the description of, of Simeon and Anna, these were people who were waiting. They were under the old covenant, the Mosaic law, but they were waiting for its fulfillment in the Messiah. Part of this old covenant was the description of all these things to reveal our sinfulness and a looking ahead to the person who would destroy sin forever, Jesus Christ. They were waiting for him. So under this law, there was hundreds, thousands of years to negotiate and realize that I am a sinner. I am in need of grace and mercy and I can't live up to the perfection. But there's one coming who can. His name is Jesus it's so the first thing we need to see in our story today. They were under this Mosaic law. The second one in the first century that Jesus is confronting in this passage is that people in Jesus' time, they were, they were under the, the teaching of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes. These were people sometimes that their way, we can go to the next slide there, Olivia, their way of, of trying really hard, there should be a little diagram one. Hey, there we go. Their way of sort of going, boy, we don't want to mess up these 613 commandments that expose our, our, our inability, our sinfulness, our nature, our against God. The way we're going to keep from, from ever getting into those is they actually called it this. We're going to put a hedge around the Torah. We're going to build walls around it and add rules upon rules upon rules to make sure we never get anywhere near breaking the rules that were given by God. And this is what Jesus is confronting. He says, boy, you're, you're, you're treating the wall as more important than the law. The walls you put up have actually become more important than the wall. The Pharisees added 1,500 additional fence walls to the law. I'll give you an example of some of them. Exodus 20.10 says that the Israelites were under a Sabbath. They were supposed to rest on the Sabbath day. So the, instead of just leaving it as that and letting people navigate through what the law says, they added these fence laws. There were 39 types of prohibited work on the Sabbath in the first century. Let me listen to this. You could not spit on the Sabbath because it would disturb the dirt and you would be guilty of plowing the land. You could not swat a fly on the Sabbath because you would be guilty of hunting. <laughs> this is great. A woman could not look at a reflection on Sabbath because she might see a gray hair and pluck it out, which would be doing work. I'm not going to ask if any of you did that this morning. They added these things in their way to try to feel like they were protecting their obedience to the law. Colossians describes what they did this way. These restrictions indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-prescribed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Years ago, and I, I don't watch the show all the time, I'm just telling you. I remember I was a kid scanning through the, 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 the channels or a teenager and coming across The Simpsons. I never thought I'd use this on Sunday morning. There's an episode where, where Homer's being tempted to cheat on his wife. He doesn't. This is an episode of The Simpsons. I remember coming across this. I want to tell you something. God can speak to you through almost anything. 
there's a scene where he's in the elevator. It's somebody, he doesn't, by the way, but there's somebody at his work he's being tempted by. And, and basically, Homer's response is to go, don't think in pure thoughts, don't think in pure thoughts, don't think in pure... And, and he's just driving himself absolutely nuts, trying not to do bad. And what ends up happening as he does that, we call it white knuckling if you're in recovery, right? Where you're just so set up on this is the only thing I need to overcome. You're just constantly in it that you end up drawing yourself to it. Have you ever experienced that? It ends up actually having the opposite effect. They are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. This did not help them obey that. But Jesus had a way better plan because it's God's plan. And this is the other thing that's at play in the scripture in our story today. All through the announcement in the Old Testament of these covenants, there was always a looking ahead to a final covenant of God with his people. All these other covenants were leading towards this final one. They were prophesying a final covenant that would put the stamp on all of them and finish the process off, a final promise between God and man, and it would come through Jesus Christ, a new covenant. Jeremiah 31 describes it this way, and our story today is the tension of these worlds emerging together, the old covenant, the traditions, and the new covenant that had come and was coming. Jeremiah described it this way. He said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, Well, I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke the covenant. Though I was a husband to them. Listen to the language God uses. Though I was a husband to them, they disobeyed, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel at that time. Last one. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will will they teach their neighbor and say one another, know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And this, after the hundreds and thousands of years of blood of animals being spilt over and over and over again for forgiveness of sin, the new covenant says this, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins. No more. Gone. I don't know if you've ever had somebody where you're working out an apology with somebody or forgiveness or something, and somebody says sort of water off the duck's back. They say, no, it's all good. All's forgiven and all forgotten. But you know, as humans, we don't do it very well, do we? It nags. It comes back up. Somebody that's wounded or hurt you. I want to tell you something. When the God of the universe says, I will forgive and I will remember their sin no more, he really has forgotten it. That's how deep the blood is. That's how rich red it runs. They're gone. They're gone. So in our confrontation today, Jesus speaking to people that are under the old covenant, and not only just under the old covenant, with all these traditions added, he starts exposing the fault, and starts letting them know that the new covenant is coming, and it's through him. It's through him. Now, a couple things out of those three things we can pull out today for us. As Christians, if if you have a relationship with Jesus, we still, and the the New Testament identifies this, have a tendency sometimes to revert back to these ways of, of thinking. And after the long introduction to a short message, a couple things today that Jesus exposes in our story. If you know the Lord today, don't don't make laws out of things where there is no command and expect everybody else to join in with you. Jesus said this to the Pharisees, you've let go of the commands of God and are just holding on to human traditions. I've been guilty of this before and maybe you have. Making mountains out of molehills, making things law that Jesus does not really care about at all. It's not the most important thing. We do it sometimes with the music we prefer in church. We do it with the things we eat and drink. The Bible in the New Testament confronts a bunch of them that Christians get caught up in. How one person celebrates a Sabbath or a holiday, how one person doesn't. How one person interacts with the marketplace, how one person doesn't. If one person drinks wine and one doesn't of making them some sort of legal standard that we now have to put on everybody else. 
I cannot from the Scripture tell you today to not drink a glass of wine. I can't tell you not to get drunk. It says that pretty clear. And I would tell you today, it's probably best that some of you don't drink at all, including me. Fair enough? Not going to. And if the Lord hasn't spoken to you about that, I'm not going to come to your house and judge you on that because the scripture doesn't give me grounds too. Doesn't give me grounds too. We're in a new way of the spirit where the spirit directs these things and guides us personally where for you, one of those things might not be great or good for you, but may not matter to someone else. I remember years ago, uh, our youth sponsors had gone out to eat somewhere. I was a youth pastor, and we were, we were having a meeting together. We went to a restaurant, and we were going to eat, and there was no tables available. And they, they said, we were sitting at the bar stool, waiting <laughs> along the bar, a, a, a restaurant in Kingston waiting. And I was sitting there, and this is not a pride thing. It's just how I grew up. I've never had alcohol in my body ever. I've never had a drink my entire life. So we're sitting at the bar, and I don't, I'm just like waiting, don't care. And I remember somebody leaned over, one of our sponsors, and just said, hey, can we sit somewhere else? And I was like, Why? It's like, I don't feel comfortable here. And it was somebody that had used to drink and it had a problem with it. The Bible talks about a weaker brother of looking out for them. Like, absolutely, we can go. It did not bother me at all because it's never been a thing. I've got other stuff, though. <laughs> I got some other weaknesses, right? That maybe are different than yours. Don't make a lot of things where there is no command and expect everybody else to follow with you. I've been in church long enough to know that there's stories, legends, right? of the morning where, where, where the, the people remove the pulpit from the platform because of some special event going on. And there's an uprising in the church because the pulpit has been moved, right? The word is not going to be spoken any longer because the pulpit is not there. Some of you might wish there is a pulpit up here. You would have felt better about it or a stage or whatever, right? But it's not the main thing. I've heard false teaching from behind a pulpit. Fair enough? It's just a form. It's not the main thing. It's not the main thing. And for whatever reason, <laughs> a multitude of reasons, the Pharisees had gotten so far into these little rules, these add-ons, out of a heart that felt like they could live up to this, that they'd gotten so far off track from the God of grace who offered mercy in their inability to live up to God's standard. I've seen this happen too, where sometimes I was a youth pastor Teenagers will unsacredize your building as fast as they can. <laughs> Not meaning to, it just happens. There's mornings here where I've come to set up for church and I'm picking Nerf darts at off the floor. It's going to happen. I can tell you a story. I remember being, uh, being on the road with our Bible college years ago. I was on a music team. We were touring around playing at camps and, and doing all those things. And we showed up at this camp. I won't tell you what state it was in. It was a little more south than here. And when we got off the bus, and this is no offense to them, but I, we did. We felt like we stepped out of, the, out of the bus and we walked into 1952. It was just very different than how I, the church culture I was in. And we were playing Christian rock music all week. And we spent the whole week trying to put fires out with people that were offended by our music and were not offended by their teenagers dying and going to hell and sneaking off into rooms with each other all week. They were offended by the music and not broken by their kids who were rebelling against Jesus. How far, how far did they get off grace by going that way? Lord, help us, right? To not get so far off onto the minors that we lose God's heart and soul in the process. Don't make a lot of things where there is no command and expect everybody to follow along. There's preferences. There's things that God has led you to in your worship to him that he may not have spoken to others about. And the second one is this. Jesus called the Pharisees out on that. Obedience to this law, as plain as day, does not make you holy like God is holy. And if you forget everything else this morning, your holiness is not dependent on your perfect life but on a perfect Savior. His name is Jesus. Galatians 2 says this, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. They're not made just before God by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. That law was to reveal our sinfulness. It was not to make us holy. 
Now, Jesus says something really interesting. This changed my life years ago when I read this. Martin Luther wrote a commentary on Romans. John Wesley was stirred by it in the same way when he was working out his salvation. He compared the works of the law to the fulfilling of the law. And Jesus said something really interesting about the Mosaic law. He said, I haven't come to abolish the law or prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And Luther noticed in the writing, and it lines up with Scripture, that there is a difference between the works of the law and the fulfillment of the law. See, in this bracket right here, you could be somebody that's living up to these commandments, even the 613 trying to, and hating them while you're doing them. Do you know what I mean by that? It's like, I'm going to do this, God, but don't like it. God is way more interested in your heart. These were to expose a dirty, sinful heart. They were not designed to fix it. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. Don't think I've come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. Some of the prophecies of Christ lead up to this this thought that Jesus didn't just obey the law. He delighted in his Father's law. He didn't just do the works, he loved to do them. He loved to do them with a perfect heart in a way that you never could, and he fulfilled them perfectly in your place, in your place. There's a story long ago uh, that was told of a a grandfather that had fallen asleep on a Sunday afternoon, and and the, the, the grandson playing this awful, dirty trick went into the fridge and grabbed this package of, of Lindberger cheese. Have you ever tried that stuff before? We all need to visit the cheese shop afterwards and find some. It's the most pungent cheese you will ever find, I have heard. And while his grandfather was sleeping, he he stuck a little bit under his nose. The grandfather woke up and went, my goodness, it stinks in here. And began wandering through the house, went into the next room, it stinks in here too. And room to room and finally flung the doors open and said, the whole world stinks. (laughs) The whole world stinks. Our tendency, apart from God revealing our sinfulness, is to feel that the whole world stinks and not recognizing that it's you that actually stinks before God. That your righteousness, the scripture says, is like filthy rags before him. There was a new way, a new covenant that God was bringing. And the tension in our passage today is revealed. Jesus drawing people back to the heart What comes out of a person is what defiles them. It's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. Have you done any of those? These are what defile a person. And Jesus Christ arrives and doesn't just do the works, but fulfills all of it perfectly. And this is what it says for those who respond to his new covenant offer. Romans 8 says this, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son, listen, in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. The righteous requirement of the law be fully met in us, not by your own efforts or your own wisdom or your own fulfilled by Jesus himself. So we don't live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And Jesus is opening the door to this new covenant, this new covenant that was going to be about heart. Christ's righteousness in place of your sinfulness, in place of your effort to be holy. Christ's righteous sacrifice, the last one for all of time. No more sacrificing of animals. He was the perfect sacrifice that brought about the forgetting of our sin and the cleansing of it forever. Christ's righteousness we receive by position, by place, by what he's done for us. Our righteous attitudes and actions are built by the Holy Spirit working in us from this day forward. 
I found this hat this week. It's really neat. I, I found this online. It kind of came up on Facebook or something on an advertisement. I love it. Move ahead to our next, uh, next thing. Next slide there. I love this. Simple as that. <laughs> How many people have a guy in your neighborhood that fixes things? Guy can do anything, right? Yeah. If you're having financial trouble and you're desperate to fix it, you go find a financial advisor. You got a guy. If you're trying to lose weight or bulk up, you go see a personal trainer. I know a guy. I don't go to him very often, but I know a guy. (laughs) If you're having trouble in your marriage or with your family, you go see a counselor. I know a guy. When you need career training to go to university, you learn from the experts. I know a few guys. When your car breaks down, you go see a mechanic. I know a guy. When you have trouble with your sin, you think you are the guy. And you're not. You're not qualified, you're not equipped, you don't have rank or authority or ability to atone for sin, only Jesus does. He's the guy. You can't do it on your own. Nothing more foolish than the flesh trying to be righteous. Lost cause. When you have trouble with sin, I know a guy. I know a guy. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians that Jesus was made to be sin, him who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And Hebrews 10, 14 says this. You can put the next slide up there, Olivia. It says this. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The position before Christ is earned by Jesus' blood, not by anything you can do. And the Bible says he didn't leave us like orphans after that, that his Holy Spirit would invade our lives and conform us to the image of the Son. That instead of being somebody white-knuckling, hating God's law, but trying really hard to fulfill it, that I would actually, because of the Spirit of God inside of me, become someone that starts delighting in what God delights in. It's a way better way. And it's a wonderful thing in your testimony when you hear somebody talk about it. How they used to be fired up and ran into all these sinful activities. And it wasn't just that God said no, and they were angry at God from taking this from them the rest of their life. They were like, no, I delight in something different now. I don't want that anymore. Because God has given me, in the place where there was a heart of stone, I now have a heart of flesh that beats and is alive because of the Holy Spirit's work. By one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who he is making holy. We serve a covenantal God. And for the hundreds of thousands of years of prescription of death of animals, of law that we cannot attain to, to expose our inability to, our undesire to, our unholiness before a holy God, and the requirements that were leading to Jesus, the new covenant, the new covenant is explained by Christ in about four sentences with one activity that we're about to do now. Let's stand. Let's stand. We are going to partake of the Lord's table today, and I'm going to lead you through a liturgy. If you don't have, we'll, we'll pause for a second. If you don't have a cup, the juice or the bread, they're right at the back at the, at the, uh, the, the sound booth there. And you can start getting those ready if you've got one. We're going to enter into a time of, of communion today. I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to lead us through a liturgy today. Father, when I look back on the time where I first came face to face with your grace, I had been trying so hard to be good for you and failed at every, at every avenue or attempt. At every avenue or attempt, I came short. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that every place where I came short, where I fell short, and every place where there was rebellion in my heart towards the things that you said were good and holy and perfect, Jesus, you fulfilled them in my place. You fulfilled them in my place. You are a savior where I could not save myself. You are the guy, the only one who has been able to live this life on the planet. I cannot do it. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that this relationship that was broken by my sin and all of our sin, Lord, does not get restored by my vain attempts at being great and good and holy before you. It is only restored by the perfect love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no other way. There is no other human that's gotten close 
to living the life that you did, Jesus. Your word says, God, that you were tempted in every way, yet you did not sin. You did it perfectly. You did it in my place. You did it for me where I was unable to attain your holiness, God. You sent one in my space, and I receive him by faith, and I am declared holy before God, and my sin is wiped away forever. Your scripture says it's buried on the bottom of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed it from me. This is by faith I have received what you have done. And if there's one here today that needs to receive the gift of salvation offered by Jesus, you've been doing it your own way, you've been trusting in your own goodness, and you've been discouraged by your failing at it, would you turn to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ today? I want to lead you in a prayer to receive that. Pray with me, God, I am a sinner. I've tried to be holy on my own, and I mess it up, I fail. I cannot live up to your holy standard. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to pay the penalty, to bleed out death for my sin, to pay its penalty and be the perfect sacrifice to pay for my sin forever before a holy God. I receive you by faith, Jesus. I put my faith and trust in your sacrifice and not in my own goodness anymore. I trust you today for that gift, and I put my faith in you. You are God, and I am not. You are Jesus, and you are Lord, crucified for my sin and resurrected for my hope of glory. I receive all that you've done for me today. And for those of us who today who maybe, like the Galatians did and people in Scripture, that got a little bit off track and got a little bit away from the grace and got a little bit caught up in the rules and the law again and have lost our way. God, I pray for us today, Lord, that you'd help us just revel in your grace this morning as we partake of the elements, your body and your blood, in remembrance of you, Jesus. Help us to just be renewed in that love and grace and mercy by the cross today. In Jesus' name, I'm going to lead you in a liturgy and you can receive the elements today. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who in mercy gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon a cross for our redemption, we praise you. We thank you for your love, for the gift of your Son, for the sacrifice he made on our behalf, for the forgiveness of our sins and the cleansing of our hearts, for the witness of your Holy Spirit in our hearts, that we are your children. Grant that as we receive the bread and the drink in memory, of Christ's death and suffering in communion with you and with your children, that we may be made partakers in his body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed said, take this bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in memory of me, and you can take the bread. This next part of our liturgy has so much beauty in it after our talk on covenant this morning. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave it to them, saying, and before I say it, hundreds of thousands of years of sacrifices, blood spilt on the ground, rules that were only to expose our frailty and our inability to live up to them. In Jesus, in one sentence, new covenant, one sentence. Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in memory of me. You can drink this morning. Father, we thank you for the gift of the cross. We thank you that you are a covenantal God. When you say our sin is atoned for, paid for, and forgotten, it is By faith, we trust you that your word is true, and God, that we can live in the newness of life today forevermore. And God, as we have been perfected before you in your presence, we've been made holy, it's been bestowed on us by Jesus. Would you help us now as far as our thoughts and behavior and activity and emotions, all these things inside of us, would you conform us now to the image of your Son and help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to live a life like your son Jesus's. 
God, we thank you for the gift of salvation and the grace that was offered to us. We revel in it today. You are so good, Lord. We praise you and we worship you in this place. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you today, church. Walk in his grace and his mercy today. We will see you next week. God bless you.